guy leapt from side to side in the back of this California. It had a massive <laughs> effect on handling. <laughs> no shit. Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the Collecting Addicts podcast. We have a full house in attendance and much to discuss, starting with what I've been up to uh, over the last week, which is the Isle of Man TT. I'm going to allow my cohorts to, to chime in here, but I'm, I'm on the back end of one of those life experiences that I want to keep telling people about. And I'm a natural gobshite, so I can't stop telling people. I just told a total stranger out on my road how great the TT was. And they thought I was talking about table tennis, which was odd. <laughs> um, so I, I have to say, I've had the most fantastic trip. Put your hands up within the group if you've been to the TT. Okay, Neil Clifford has, no one else has. Um, let me now? tell you how it works. It's not a, um, it's not your average race weekend. I went for the week of qualifying. Imagine that Formula One's qualifying happens for an hour on a Saturday afternoon. Th this has an entire week of qualifying. Um, and I'm, I can't just speak as a monologue for too long because I, I, contrary to common opinion, I don't actually like the sound of my own voice. So I will have to get these people to chime in and do some fucking legwork. Otherwise, I'm going to find this a bit difficult. <laughs> um, so I went for the qualifying week. I'd never been before. It was a rite of passage. I booked a ferry in January because I'm so disorganised. I thought to myself, January the 4th, I'm gonna, if I don't book one of these bloody things now, they'll get sold out. So we booked our steam packet, um, which is a great service, but is quite expensive for a motorcycle. They're making good money. We paid, I had two bikes on a return, leaving on the most inconvenient times imaginable. And it was nearly 500 pounds. Wow. Think how many motorcycles you can get on a ferry. <laughs> Neil Clifford, we need a ferry company as soon as possible. We do, we do, <laughs> we do. I think I was the only car, I went in a Nissan R34. Yeah. What did you go in that for? I don't loves Japanese know. Cars. I didn't even like the car, obviously. <laughs> Japanese. Okay, so that's like turning up. That's I, like just doing... thought, I, I thought it was a cool sort of, you know, there's a Japanese vibe, isn't there? Because all the bikes are bloody Japanese, yes. basically. Yes. So I did, yeah, I, I took an R34 with me. But it was, I mean, being stuck on a, your talk, Chris, much better than I, but being stuck on a mountain all day, because obviously I didn't know that you when you parked up, they then close the road. So you're basically stuck if you're on a motorway, on a, on, a, on, a, on a mountain all day, watching these absolute lunatics do things that, you know, probably shouldn't be legal anymore. But thank God it is still legal because it's incredible. It is. It's a demonstration of skill, bravery and a total lack of imagination that I, I really can't celebrate enough. Um, yes, we want the steam packet. I went with my friend James, who's known as TI22 on Instagram and is one of the loveliest human beings imaginable. I think he's the nicest week. Welshman ever. He is. He, he's, uh, I think it's a special week for both of us. Uh, and we slightly didn't rough it. We roughed it a bit. We ate the most wonderful kipper cobs in the morning, went for our morning rides, went over the mountain at, at crazy speeds. I have to say, it's the best motorsport spectator thing I've ever done because I felt part of it, uh, and, I, and I felt that the locals and, and the, the fans were incredibly welcoming. I felt it got close to the competitors in a way I hadn't done before, and I think it's, it made me understand what it must have been like to be in the Formula One paddock in the 1960s, these gladiators that take risks that I can't even comprehend. Um, yeah, it was, it was much more like a rock concert feeling for me you know when you the, when your favorite track comes on and the live music hits you in the chest your solar plexus sort of reacts to it and then you have an emotional reaction and if you're like me you think i mustn't cry don't fucking cry because this is is a bit totes emotion i think i felt that when i saw mcginnis come past deliberately on the back wheel um at uh ago's leap and we were we were stood there and i'd never seen them go past and john mcginnis who i was there with who, who was just as we know, one of the legends of life. Um, he, um, he, I think his, his, his wonderful daughter, Maisie, who's 12 years old, who is the star of the McGuinness family by a mile. She just, she's got them all totally covered. He went past the battle and she went, Dad did that on purpose because he knew you were there. <laughs> and I, I just thought, I can't really understand how that <laughs> yeah, works. I, I wouldn't even know where I was. So that's a very brief eulogy. I'll probably chime in again in a minute. But I want to open the floor to to other experiences we've had. They don't have to actually be motorsport related. Um, things that you've seen that are visceral, 
that uh, that make you think that also make you I think one of the things that summarize this is the sense why didn't I see this before and I'm so glad that I have because if I hadn't my life wouldn't be complete yeah. I'll open but Chris, before you move it on, you, you've got to tell everyone about the WhatsApps that you sent us. This nutty was sending us WhatsApps of people flying. They, they weren't actually driving any of They were flying at 200 miles an hour past news agents and things. There's yeah. a shot here. I've got it here. You're next to a bus shelter. A guy with... <laughs> it's just ridiculous. He goes by doing a wheelie at 175 miles an hour. And there's a lady who's just sort of leaning on on the brick wall, just going. Oh, there's another one. There's a lovely, no, there's a just, lovely there's all, all sorts of randomness around the circuit where real life, real Manx life, is just embedded in in the race in the competition weekend and well, sorry, fortnight. And there's there's a there's a little place where you can go and the the ladies of the WI give you clotted cream and scones whilst you're watching. <laughs> Michael Dunlop come past on an average lap of 135 miles an hour. So I'm not a stato. The lap is 37.73 miles long currently. Um, Michael Dunlop broke the record on Friday when we yeah. were there uh, and he set 135 mile hour lap. He, he, he pushed the bar so much, higher. it's 135 and a half. So that's like going three seconds faster in qualifying than everyone else. Um, it is, there are three aliens at the moment. There's Michael Dunlop, um, uh, Peter Hickman and Dean Harrison. They are the three that are pushing harder. But my, my buddy John McGuinness came sixth on Sunday, which I think is remarkable for a 51-year-old bloke who's kind of the elder statesman of the sport. All I can say is this, and I, I, I sounded glib when I was on the telly box for the TT people. I think if you if you have any interest in racing or any interest in the internal combustion engine and any interest in people that just have demonstrate a skill that you can't fathom, you owe it to yourself to go. And you don't have to be some grizzled, gnarled biker that's got stories of going there for 50 years. It's open, it's accommodating. You can wobble along on your motorcycle, look really amateurish on the ferry like I did. No one's going to judge you. People will help you. If you drop your bike, five lads that look really scary in Hells Angels jackets will pick it up and give you a hug. You know, it's that kind of place. I just I, think I, you have to go. I'd need their numbers before I travel because you know how hopeless I am on anything with two wheels. Uh, they, they always just fall over and they're never where I left them. I've always, I've always kind of avoided it. And in part, I've avoided it because I've been just so scared for them. And, you know, one doesn't want to tempt fate about this year's event. So I won't talk about what's, ha what's happening, what might happen after we record and so forth. But I've always felt scared for them. But this year, I, I guess because somebody who I know and love and trust and respect, you know, that's you, Chris, has been there. And you've brought it to life for us, in the, as M Manny said on the WhatsApps. And social media, a bit like the Nürburgring 24 the other week, suddenly more so than I've ever noticed. It's been brought to life by social media. And it's extraordinary. And I think it might not be here forever. It's the, every other form of motorsport has got safer and safer and safer for various reasons. The circuits have changed. The equipment has changed. For these guys, it's the same. They're just faster. You know, the trees are just as tree-like. The bus shelters are just as bus shelter-like. And they're still squidgy, fragile humans. Nothing's changed. It's just got more and more dangerous. And the fact that they're, I, I can't begin to comprehend how they do it. You know, Monkey, you know, you know, we've raced at the Nürburgring. That's a bloody fast place. The car can be airborne at 170 miles an hour. And every lap you do that, every lap you go down the foxhole at the Nürburgring at night, it's a big, hold your breath. It never gets normal. But that's walking in the park compared to these guys. I just, I'm totally in awe. And I had an emotional reaction to your emotional reaction, which was, we've got to do it. You know, I'd, I'd have to, I'd fall off a scooter a dozen times on the way there, but we've got to do it. It's just- I think, I think you definitely, definitely have to do it. I think Chris is right. You, it's a, if you're into motorsport in any way, you have to go. I've got a funny little analogy, actually. It's nothing to do with motorsport. I was just thinking then, my three, I've got three older brothers and we're from Portsmouth. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm the young one. I was, I was- I was the last attempt at a girl. 
<laughs> by my mother, probably hence the shoe thing. And um, all three of them went to the Isle of Wight Festival, because we're from Portsmouth, in 1970. 70, that's right. And, um, you know, one of them, I think, was only sort of 13 or something, but they went over to the Isle of Wight Festival to see Jimi Hendrix. I think it was in the August. And um, he died in the September. And they always talk about it like, thank fuck we went to the Isle of Wight Festival when it was going on. And I think it's a bit like the TT. We'll always regret yeah. if you don't go. Everyone yeah. should go because it's like seeing Jimi Hendrix. It's yeah. that important. Yeah. You know, I will say just this idea that um, things that are inherently dangerous are quietly being phased out of our lives. But there's something about this event, because it's not some mainstream BBC One or Sky One or NBC event, it, you know, it, it has a following of its own. And that in itself means it has a kind of purity. And, and it, it would be wonderful to experience it because it is the thing in itself. What you didn't say is that they're not flying meals out of Maxine in Paris. You said you eat kippers. You know, you went on a ferry with your bike. I mean, it just doesn't get to get more no, authentic. it's beautiful. It's like going back yeah. in time a little bit, really. There isn't, no, really, in. there isn't really, the, there is no option to go full corporate. You <laughs> might get invited by a bike manufacturer, but there's there's no infrastructure to treat people like AAA listers because they're not interested in it. You don't acknowledge, everyone there falls under the heading of your shit smells the same. Sadly, it's a crude phrase, <laughs> but you do. And uh, I think it's all the better for it. There's yeah. there's also an aspect to it that I'm going back. Uh, I'm going back on on the weekend, so just after this is broadcast, because I want to watch the senior on Saturday. Ooh. I might have got the bug slightly, but I just think that now is the time. And I think when I watch them go out before their qualifying session on Thursday, there was a moment of calm. So there was the, there was the hustle and bustle of a race paddock of getting machinery prepared of operators of that machinery getting themselves prepared, looking at their equipment, going through their ticks and their routine. There was that. But the last 90 seconds before they went out was different. There was a difference. They was, there was, the, 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 the stairs went further than a thousand yards. Uh, they didn't talk to each other really. There was, there was, there was, they're not combative. They don't want to not be next to each other, but they don't really talk. And I'm, I'm led to believe that the atmosphere before they go out to the senior is is even more um, reverential. I, th I think there's a there's an electricity to the atmosphere that I've never felt before at a racing event, uh, and and, as, and an, a knowledge and an acceptance of what those what those riders are about to go through, the risks yeah. they're about to take by everyone around them. So uh, yeah, I'm, starting, I'm making it sound a bit too much, like quasi. Um, no. religious experience you, you, but I, you know, I guess it's the closest guys, I've come to religion in the probably in the last 30 years of my life you, I just thought you it was just awesome. use the key word you've used the word religion have you have you read um the right stuff or seen the um yeah. seen the movie it's, it's, yeah. it's I've read that the book, read the book. I went thing. to watch the movie again it was crap oh no no it's it oh, no 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 it's, it's not as crap as you, it, there's a beautiful moment when you actually see the bar in this absolute shithole that they go and have a drink at and there's a description of the astronauts, and they describe them as monastic. Yeah. And I just think it's weird. It's like a little monastery up there. There's nothing there except speed. They go to that mountain. They sit there. It's arid. They maybe have a beer after they've broken the sound barrier. It's it's most it's a most beautiful description. And then there's a do you remember the simple vision? The Bell X One, and there's a horse, and Jaeger's sitting on the horse looking down at this. And that's what you're describing. It's so pure it's so beautiful it's such a sort of you know this is it this is what i was put on earth to do and this could be the last time i do it just there's, that um, moment there's also something um to continue the non-commercial theme they don't get paid enough i don't understand the risk they take for the remuneration they have so they're always hustling and the hustle brings with it <laughs> so many fun stories and mcginnis is mcginnis is, is selling anything he can he's, he's a legend but he's if he walks into the paddock, he'll sell your book, he'll do anything. We went out for a meal on Friday night. He arrived with 20 bottles of gin to put behind <laughs> the bar to sell. I mean, it's, I just love it. You know, does yeah. he, does, you know, I just think there's something honest about it. And, and what's, what's interesting is the way they view other sports and other motorsports. 
there's a respect. They don't just assume that because everyone else takes less risk than them, that they're not worthy. That would be too, too simplistic. And these are clever men. Don't think they're blunt instruments. They may come across as that. It's all a, that's all an act. They're very, very intelligent people. They respect it, but I think they don't. They can't see what the fuss is about. Sometimes <laughs> they they think everyone's going. Oh, you should have seen how difficult this was for me. And they're thinking, hang on a minute, I was. Yeah. I was about to lose control at 190 next to a bus stop. <laughs> so that, there is a respect. They don't, they don't dismiss everything else. But I think there's this, maybe part of the currency they have, the remuneration they have is an emotional one in that they know they're the only people on the planet that can sit there and maybe be a bit sniffy about other motorsports. They can say, you might think you're hard, but you're not. No. You, so can't, well, move, you can't move your head quick enough when you're stood on the side of the road you can't actually do that yeah. quick enough to see the bloody thing. Yeah. It's the most mental thing, isn't it? And it's do funny you, how you, you can... You follow, are you following the race on, um, on your phone or something so you know who's coming when? Yeah, you have a, it's, it's strange. It's, it, you need someone with you to teach you how to do it. You look at split times. So there's a live timing app. No, sorry, it's on the website. You just look at the, the sector times. There are, I think, four or five sectors. And you just look at the sector times as they come through. It gives you an order. And it just get, it, as in F1, it gives you a green or a purple. If someone's gone quickest of the session, it's green. If they go quicker than they've ever been, it goes purple. But really, you're, you need to get to Marshall Post. And if you stand near a Marshall, they get, they get a note from the previous Marshall Post telling you who's coming through. Wow. Um, so you, but there is no live feed as such if you're out and about. But you can go back to the fan village and watch the live feed on the fan village there. It's just, honestly, it's and, it's and, so and practically good. speaking. So Neil said he got stuck on a hill all day. You know, mm. if you're on a bike, is there other ways of moving around whilst the racing's going on? Yeah, there is. I mean, the sessions don't last long enough for you to be able to move more than once, really. But what you would do is you can you can go south of the circuit go up around the side of where Peel is. And there's, you know, Kirk, My we went to Kirk Michael an hour and a half into a session and got there. It's it's slow moving. And, and you know, you shouldn't go there on a bike to think you can hoon the whole time. There are speed guns out everywhere, quite rightly. But, so you you can move. And, and within reason, there's not many bad places to watch the action. You don't want to be somewhere slow or a hairpin, really. And that funny little jump thing, I, I wouldn't want to watch it there, really. But everywhere else, you know, if they're averaging 135 miles an hour, the clue's in the number. You're going to see them <laughs> tanking along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, in, it's interesting how the, the forms of motorsport that you and I and everybody's familiar with, F1 or whatever, there's a lap time. US motorsport, largely because it's kind of going around in circles, they'll have a Indies classic of speed. But this one, you think, why have they got a speed? And then you see the speed and you think that's why they use speed, because the numbers are unbelievable. <laughs> And I mean, it it's like the Targa Florio still exists, isn't it? Yeah. And you've still yeah, got guys bombing week. around in 917s or 910s or whatever. Yeah. That that That's the equivalent. From and that's 50 years ago, whatever it is now, since yeah. we did that. And 73. Yeah. I want to ask Chris Cooper a question here, because in your official role on the Motorsport UK, I think the Isle of Man TT, even though we want to admit it, has a, a big influence on how we respond to track limits and what is the circuit yeah. and what risk you should take. Because there's no doubt to any of us that if the Isle of Man existed or the Isle of Man circuit admitted, uh, existed in the same layout, but in the middle of the Sahara Desert with, with, multi, with as much runoff as possible, the average speed would probably be 150 miles an hour. But, but the riders are managing their environment. They have to. They're a play, and the reason why Michael Dunlop beyond his extraordinary talent and, and size of gonads is going faster is he's he's pushing it a bit further than the others that's what he's doing yeah um so how do we is, is the other man not testament to the fact that we we do we don't need a risk as high as that but there needs there needs to be a consequence jeopardy doesn't there, there needs to be jeopardy and i think interesting enough i'm at i'm at motorsport eight uh, uk hq today we had a board meeting today and we talked about track limits today and not surprisingly everybody talked about the TT and I was quite not just because we've been talking about it all week and I was quite taken with how many people here look at it and just say that's uh, uh, just how do they do it and there is part of the debate which is about the jeopardy and we talked about 
I think we've talked about amongst ourselves. Those of you who have looked at the, the physical changes that have taken place at Spa uh, Grand Prix circuit, particularly at Eau Rouge, where they've literally pushed the hill back on the as you're going up the hill on the left, that old house has gone, the hill's gone back, big grandstand. And it's effective created a track that's 300 meters wide. So rather than going down past the old pits and a sort of a quite an interesting right turn in the dip, this sort of it's a little bit of a turn and someone's just going straight up the hill. And that can't be right. And I think it's it's changing the nature of the sport for, for track sport, motorsport, four wheel sport. Um, and one of the Niels Vittich, I think, uh, was it De Freitas, who was the WEC a race director, one of the two who is the briefly the two F1 race directors. He made his comment in a briefing a, few, uh, a year or two ago to say, if you I want you to imagine there's a wall around the track, like at Monaco or like at the TT. If you go over that, I'm going to assume you've hit the wall and I'm going to call you in because we want to check your car for damage. <laughs> Just, and that check may take some time. And I thought, <laughs> that's all I want to hear is to say, yeah. come on, guys. So I think culturally, behaviorally, I think watching that, watching the TT and the respect for, there's some status or somewhere for how close people got to the exit of saint devot turn one at Monaco. And George got closest about four or five centimeters. And but he didn't touch it. But, and we talked before, they can still get away with touching it. You can't, you couldn't touch a bus shelter <laughs> or a telegraph pole. So I, th I think hmm. uh, the debate today was really interesting. And there's going to be more, most of what UK is going to say in public with our sport in the coming months about what we want to, how we want to bring everyone together on track limits and the safety and all that. I'm going to say. But watching, some of those clips, I think, will be helpful for everyone. It's extraordinary. I also want to add a couple more things. First of all, a couple of riders to look out for. Um, uh, uh, Davy uh, Davy Todd is just fantastic. He's young. He's an absolute. He's backing it in everywhere. You have to watch him. It's just extraordinary to watch. James Hiller as well. Um, he 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 came around to say hello a couple of points during the week. He's just a another really interesting human being. Shout out to them. If you go there, you must go to Peel to this place on the seafront where they do a kipper cob. You've got to eat that. It's it's really joyous. Vinegar um, on there. Sorry. Vinegar. I on went the for I went cob. for a bit of vinegar and a bit of salt. Actually, I didn't know. What, here's a question for you all: What salt would you put on a kipper? I know I'd go for horseradish. I'd also go potentially for Liam Perrins, but there wasn't any. I might put oh. a bit of Worcester sauce on there. Any other any other chimes in on the sauce there? Doused in Tabasco. vinegar. Tabasco. Yeah, oh, Tabasco would work. Tabasco would work. I think yeah. it's horseradish. Is it? Yeah, okay, horseradish, fair enough. Um, no. Right. So if there, there's still no speed limits, can you take your car to the Isle of Man and drive really fast and not get done? I I'm, asking for, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> yes, I think I think at certain times of the year when you go over the mountain road, they will they will leave you alone. But if you go too fast, you might get done for dangerous or due care and attention. Yeah. That's my interpretation. There yeah. are speed limits on the island. There are very much speed limits during the TT weekend. And the, the first serious incident that happened this week, obviously, was nothing to do with the race weekend at all. It was, uh, it was punters on the roads. The mountain on a bike, if you're like me and you've got a, a vaguely naked bike and you're doing 130 miles an hour across... A, a moor which is like a sort of wide b road it's not it doesn't feel like an a road and your lids lifting off and every, and a couple of people are coming past you and you, you, it's two lanes in one direction it does feel quite grown up and I, and I will say the bit i found confusing was in amongst all the bikes there was a white audi rs3 that got in amongst it and it, and i just think they're oil and water i don't think cars and bikes mix in that environment <laughs> no. so when he arrived I, I when he arrived i went and i'm out you Did I see a picture of a, a green Porsche Taycan that rolled or something like that? Was that on the Isle of Man? Could have been. I don't know. I didn't see yeah. it. I saw. Right. I saw. I saw a Hayabusa that was in a bad, bad way. I didn't. Yeah. I don't know what, what its operator was like. It's you know th th these things are there are consequences to riding bikes. I know that, but I I, I also feel quite strongly that the, the bike and the car community probably spend a bit too much time bitching about each other. You know, bikers think that we're all a bit. Car drivers are all a bit soft and shandy drinking and we all think they're a bit northern and brainless but you know they're, they're two communities with an awful lot in common and yep. we should be able to celebrate each other's yep. sports totally and totally. I, as, as a sort of de facto representative of the car community i was really heartened by how kind and welcoming the, the bike brilliant. community was 
Brilliant. So uh, it was um, it was honestly magical. Please, please, next year go get on the steam packet, waste some money, eat kippers. Don't go to bed too late. That's the other thing. It doesn't feel like the more. It's not full of people getting absolutely out of control till five in the morning. There's some of that going on in town. But most people just have a few beers. And I think they're so traumatised by what they're seeing. <laughs> they're in bed by 11.30 and up in the morning. Yeah. So there you go. That's my call to action. I'm not on a percentage from the official Isle of Man TT account, but I bloody well should be. <laughs> now, we're going to move on to... Now, this is out of the frying pan uh, and into the fire. Uh, camper vans. Um, there were a lot of camper vans in, uh, in the Isle of Man because the race paddock is somewhere where I think many people imagine they would use their camper van if they bought one. But I know there's a man here who's uh, one of our two respectable members who has got many stories tell about camper vans and he want, he's itching because he researched camper vans for last week but never got to talk about them. Neil Clifford, tell us about camper vans. I love a camper van. <laughs> and I think I don't really like people that don't like camper vans. I lived in one for six months, as you know, I've, I've said that before in Australia. But I think, what do I think about them? Um, it's about escape, isn't it? It's about freedom. It's about getting away from work and Wi-Fi and meetings and fucking hot houses. I mean, we all love our partners, but houses are always too hot, aren't they, for men? And you're opening the window and she's closing the window and then the heat, you want the heating off and you can escape all that and you can sleep outdoors with the, with the stars and the birds and the peace and quiet. And I think it's just, I don't know, it's a bit caveman. It's a bit escapism. I, I've got a good friend who's gave me great advice once. I don't do it, but maybe I'll do it at one end of the, of the day. Get up with the birds and go to bed with the birds. And I think it's a beautiful bit of advice. And this is clearly a very smart man, as is for TR7s. So, yeah. so it's, got to be, it's got to be correct. One of today's great thinkers. And, and the, other, the other thing I'd add on campus, two things, actually. One is obviously nature. You can see the world because you're driving very slowly. You can park up in the west coast of Wales or Scotland or the Peak District or Exmoor or Norfolk and see those wonderful sunsets. But you can also, the simplicity of your little Balletti coffee machine and your single little hob gas cooker and your sausage sandwich. And life, life is a simpler life. And I think often we all, we all hang, hanker after that, don't we? The other bit I'd add is gadgets. The one thing about <laughs> camper vans is one can really express our sort of male love of gadgets. Yep. Lamps, charging lamps, knives, coffee machines. mobile speakers, three or four mobile speakers. There's a great company called Snow Peak. Please have a look on their website. It's distortion expensive. You know, coffee cups are made of titanium and they're like 90. Oh, I've got some of these. They're Snow fantastic. Snow yes. Peak. It is just. Yeah. I've got fantastic. a knife and fork of theirs. Yeah, I think it's as much as a Rolex. There's what, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a shop on the Lower Regent Street, but it's Japanese, and you know the Japanese are the most nutty, beautiful people of the world, aren't Snow they? Peak. They all go camping, and there's magazines of, you know, where they all go camping in these sort of thousand-pound titanium cups. The chairs, you can have numerous vehicles of charging. We've all got that sort of charging insecurity, haven't we? So you've got yep. all your chargers out, and you're charging your chargers. Yep. And and you're basically you're just you're just away from all the shit that sometimes we all <laughs> are too deeply stuck in. So I think simple life, seeing nature, and playing with gadgets. I mean, what can be not better for a man than that? So it's just a, a camper van is different to that beautiful German motorhome, which has the floor that lowers, and a GT2 RS comes. That's all a bit. That's a bit wanky. All of that. <laughs> I've done the Heimer, you know, I did the sort of 35, 40 grand Heimer. My, bless her, my wife went in it once. She's like, I'm not going that again. Um, can we just get a hotel, please? It's like a 2% two, <laughs> two of the cost. Um, uh, there's, there's quite a big movement in America now where people are buying these converted vans and living in them full time. Yeah. They're, they're, they're amazing. Grid. 
It's getting off grid. I think, you know, yeah. it's a big trend anyway, isn't it? You know, we all want our houses that are off grid and, you know, whatever. But I think I think yeah. it's the, the, the sense of freedom. I did actually buy, there's a big story, which I can't really share on here, but it's funny. I did actually buy the most magnificent, Ed will know, hamper van off collecting cars. And it's a converted Defender that had been around Africa, the most fantastic thing. And I'm desperate. My poor bloody son, he's dyslexic Mike, like me, is doing his GCSEs at the moment. The minute he's finished, we're off. And we're going to that place that Chris referred to that I've got on my map in that lovely little beach in the west of Wales. And we're going to cook sausages. Yeah, perfect. And actually, you wouldn't want to... It wouldn't be the same if you went there in a really fancy sports car. No, no, you no. went up and, in a GT3 touring there. And that's no. the thing. You it's, look at it. You can have a fridge. You can have a cooker. Oh, I've got all of it. Cook stuff. Yeah. You can just, and that well, sort of that sense of independence of, I'm sure lots of laws that you can't get up from your seat and go and make a cup of tea when you're going down the M4, or whatever it is. But that sense of independence and gadget. Well, have a cup of tea. Have a cup of tea going down the motorway, and there's you can also drive them like talking about TT, like sidecars. Do you remember, Monkey? You and I, you had a VW Caravelle camper van. I had a California. It wasn't mine. California was Volkswagen. I couldn't afford one at the time. I barely can now. They're not cheap. It was the one you Very borrowed. Yeah. The California, and we discovered. And not only would it do 130 kilometers an hour down one of those <coughs> big dips in the motorway back 130 from, miles an hour boss 130 <laughs> miles an hour on the way back past spa um on that beautiful smooth but sort of sweepy road back through kelberg and gerolstein from the ring if because you were driving if i leapt from side <laughs> to side in the back of this california it had a <laughs> massive effect on handling and then no on, those big, on those big dips on the motorway, if I ran four to aft, it made a massive difference to pitching. What could we go wrong? Did... Do you remember being? Do you remember being ten minutes into a Euro tunnel when you went? You know when you said, "Is there any LPG on board?" I don't think you told the truth. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, I do remember that. And we did. I just forgot it had a gas can in it. And we mentioned it before, our, our mutual friend, Guy Spur of the coffee roasting business. He and I took a camper van to the 2006 Young Timer race, which is an amazing German festival of all things wonderful 60s, 70s, 80s touring cars. Because Guy used to own that original E30 DTM car, the first one that won the DTM championship, the Eric van der Poel car, Zach Speed. And he bought it for something like 30,000 euros. And we raced it in the Young Timer race. We went there in a on the way back, because the car broke, we are a bit frustrated to be left early on the Friday night before the 24 hours. And we did Belgium flat. Didn't lift the throttle throughout Belgium. It's not saying <laughs> much, because that was sort of between 65 and 75. But in a camper van, 75 miles an hour feels like too much. So I just think they're so cool. And in a way that caravans just sort of aren't. It's just the whole thing's coming with you. It's just... I think they're so cool. I love mm. it. And I'm I think of... uh, for me, the camper van, uh, when it works, it's 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 the greatest human invention. When it doesn't work or when the environment's wrong, they really are a bit, a bit of an albatross around your neck. <laughs> so the UK for me is a bit small for camper van culture. I think we found out during the lockdown that a few too many people bought them. And the romance of turning up to your spot, your secluded spot, and finding they're already 32. Uh, stockbrokers with their families in in that particular lay-by probably shatters the illusion at which point the hotel might seem quite attractive <laughs> Amer america of course is the home of the rv um and their rv culture is is just superb yeah, I mean, you know, really, never be yeah. sniffy the the infrastructure is sensational you turn up everything's clean you can get power you can get water you can you can pretty much travel day in day out and not see another human being the appeal must be must be so great but the country is vast and that's yeah. why they can do it. I was, I was looking up some, um, some RVs. I, I so nearly have bought an RV so many times, I've never owned one. But one of the quirks of American RV classes, I love this. This, this is the equivalent of irregular verbs in English and the rules of cricket. The class A yeah. is the biggest of all the, um, of all the uh, RVs over there. The class B is the smallest. Yeah. And the class C sits in the middle. 
<laughs> How does that work? Go figure. <laughs> I understood. Yeah. I was really, so if you want a, a C class, it's bigger than a B, but the A is the biggest of the lot. An A, by the way, is one of the big coaches, like a coach, basically. It's a yeah. full coach built. Um, and a B is, is is a minivan. It could be anything from a from a caravel to someone just converted a little van. And the C is, are the ones that I love. They're the ones that are sort of Lexington make them, and they can have a double slide out. But ultimately, they're best. They quite often on an F four fifty chassis, uh, and they're just sensational. You sleep over the cockpit where you the drive. one with the bit over the cap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, those, I, those, I camp, those campsites in America. I once bought a car in San Francisco, and drove for four months around all of the national parks staying in it was a like a, a kojak sort of ford taurus thing but you stop in all those camp campsites in all of bryce national park arches yellowstone you know whatever you can it's just wonderful that there's little cafes that you can do your washing you can have a shower you've got beautiful nature this really set up there to do like a you could go around america for a year well, people are in their retirement do it ad infinitum, exactly. don't they? Yeah. It also, on, on, without wanting to, to try and be profound, it's very easy to complain or, or view our American neighbours as being a bit myopic and they don't understand the outside world. Once you travel around America in a camper van, they don't need to leave. Yeah, there is There's just no need world. to leave because they've got everything on their doorstep. Yeah, yeah. You, can't, magnificent you can't accuse them of not being curious because they can drive to Washington State Forest which is so big, you can't get your head around it. Yeah. Now, I've, I've had multiple discussions with my very, very good friend, Mr. LeBlanc, who's insistent still that there's stuff in there that we don't know about, therefore people <laughs> that could exist. He yeah. bases his entire philosophy of that on that. And I have to say, it's a difficult thing to argue against. When you see yeah. the size of it, it's quite conceivable Anything's we possible. don't know what's in there. Yeah. You know, 20, 20, um, 20, 20 something years ago, not quite a camper van story, but... Um, <clears throat> My son's godfather is a pediatric plastic surgeon in Oxford, Mark, and um, great guy. And he was at medical school with uh, a couple of guys. They're all, all of them are, are surgeons now, various surgeons around the country. Um, at medical school, they were known as the goat men for various anatomical reasons that we don't need to get into. But uh, they decided... <laughs> when they when they'd all done their kind of big surgical exams, they decided that they were going to drive from Bristol, Bristol, um, to Cape Town, and they did it. And they got a long wheelbase Land Rover with the tent, you know, the ones yeah. with the tent on the top. Yeah, that's and I remember, I saw, it's just it was beautiful. So it was it was white, and they nicknamed it Nanny. And on the side, they had a kind of map of Africa with a goat on it. And said, "Go at Africa." <laughs> so the three of them <laughs> got into this thing. It took them six months to go there, and it was a most incredible journey. And they they did a wonderful diary. And um, one of them, for example, I don't think he's eaten a vegetable in his life. And uh, he, you know, a little cut on his uh, shin became a massive festering wound because he doesn't do any requisite, you know, vitamins. No matter how much sort of a carpy or wildebeest you eat, that's not going to heal. But the, the, the point and moral of the story is exactly that, that just in their early 30s, they just decide they know that they're going to be consultant surgeons for the rest of their lives. And they're going to basically have their four weeks holiday and four weeks study mm -hmm. leave. And they're going to have kids and they're going to have wives. And this is their last crack at just total freedom from a world which is going to be full of exams and full of patients. And I, it, it was amazing. I went, I went out to Cape Town to go and see Mark at the end of this journey. And he was working for free at, uh, there's a hospital called Grootskur. And um, some of the injuries, some of the violence, some of the stuff that you see there. And he, he gave me a call to, could you bring my camera to casualty? And I said, why? And he said, I just need to take a photo of this because I'm going to write this case up. And I, I thought someone was taking the mickey. There was a, they have a, they have a sort of cutlass there called a panga. I don't, it's a cutlass and it's got two sort of prongs in it. And I thought somebody was standing by an x-ray machine holding one beside them because it was this panga stuck in this guy's skull. Oh. And um, <laughs> <a> big knife. <laughs> Exactly. With, with the x-ray, with the x-ray from the other side, you realise it was actually in his skull. Now, I remember, I mean, I, you know, dig digressing massively, but it 
you know, it was a one trip in my entire life I wish I had gone on. Mm. And that would have been just sort of a great six month adventure, four of us. Maybe I'd have made them eat vegetables, but um, it re- they came back completely different men, the three of them. You do. I was, it, I was, it was a, a bit of a wanker bit. before I went. <laughs> I can't. No, you, you, yeah, no, it makes you a better person traveling the world. I think it does. Yeah, yeah. You know, the more you see them, you know, I was, I, I wasn't really a wanker, but I was, I was, I'm nicer now. <laughs> I remember actually Edward Edward and I went with his father, his parents to spa in uh, in there that was a, it was a, wasn't you know it wasn't I've a got coach, that written down there <laughs> but it was um it was it was freaking hilarious I think yeah. there's a comedy to it as well I think when you see <laughs> when you see people that you've you've only seen them in one environment operating in a totally different environment you know if that person happens to be a groundsman or something it's Stands the reason they're going to have a camper van or a, or, a, or, a, or a caravan. But if you see, you know, someone who's quite serious reputation professionally, suddenly, you know, trying to work the tap on the on the <laughs> camper van or something's not working or they can't get the satellite TV to work, it is very, very funny. I have to say, <laughs> right? It, it was highly amusing, wasn't it? We, I, I just remember we we were getting pissed that he was driving and we were all getting pissed in the back <laughs> playing <laughs> poker. <laughs> what well, was well, he, he couldn't take us seriously at all yeah. and he was just yeah. when you shut up there's another bottle of rosé got cracked <laughs> <laughs> then we then we did the standard you know the old day you get straight on the ferry get up to lang and to the brasserie oh, yeah. so you can have some chicken in a heavy cream sauce and drink another bottle of white <laughs> it was it was it was just <laughs> they, they were cracking days i'd love another california i, I have to say <laughs> i naturally gravitate to the smaller ones Yes. I want to be able to go anywhere. Really. Yes, that's and, true. And I think this, the width, there's a there's a height and weight restriction in the UK that means there aren't really any American RVs you can use outside of events. Um, yeah, but they are amazing. And, and we, this we'll leave this here. However, we will also discuss the fifth wheel caravan at a later date because that is a great discovery of mine. And I'll let you into a secret: my last four family holidays, with my kids have been in fifth wheel caravans. Um, because I am that much of a spiv. I don't like going abroad for my holiday because I do too much flying for work. And the fifth wheel caravan is a nugget of gold, which leads me naturally on to our next subject. <laughs> this is a roller coaster this week. It really is. I don't know who set this agenda. It wasn't me. How important is raw speed in the context, I have to say, of a sports car? I don't think we can have raw speed in the context of a Ford Fiesta because I don't think anyone really gives a shit. But I, I think this is this is posed by Mr. Cooper, and it's a really valid uh, area to discuss. How much do we care about how fast cars actually are? What's it about? Is it about how you feel? Is it about what you hear? Is it about steering? Is it about brakes? Is it about noise? Is it about your passenger? Is it about the music you're listening to? Is it about Neil Clifford's shoes? I don't know. What is it? Tell me, Chris Cooper, what you want to discuss here. So um, I think the premise of this question, and um, my boys, Finn and Camry, were talking about what we want to talk about, and they both said, you've got to talk about this. And and their view, and I think mine as well, is that raw speed is increasingly a compensation for the absence of other things. Yep. And we all grew up with, and you know, and marketing people in car businesses and the magazines, all stuff you've done, Monkey, you know, what's not 60 time, what's not 100 time? And less is more in that. And it's, and it's always been that way. And will the new one feel faster? But that's increasingly compensating for the absence of, does it feel like a performance car? And, you know, we everyone knows that, you know, even on track days now, track days are really, really busy. We'll talk about track days at some point. A lot of people go on track days. I remember when they started, Frankie, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, they were for ordinary people with ordinary road cars. Now they're not. They're increasingly where racing teams and racing people take their cars. Mm-hmm. So even just enjoying a normal road car, like a hot hatch or a Golf GTI or an M3 or something, you're going to get buzzed and bewildered by people racing cars. So the modern performance car, ironically, has got to be more and more home uh, on the road. And if you can enjoy that once in a blue moon, but when you sort of, it's late at night and nobody's looking and you sort of squeeze the power a bit more than you should do, what's the point of it the rest of the time? So I think raw speed, raw speed is not that important. It feels good. It never doesn't feel good. It always feels good. 
but that's a fleeting and passing emotion. And I'm, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have an Alpine A110. And I, I drove it up here today to Bista. And I loved it. It just reminded me, it weighs about 1,070 kilos. I got one of the pure ones. It's four years old and I got it when they were first out. And it's just a lovely thing. It feels good. It feels like a performance car as soon as it starts to move. It doesn't have to be very fast. Got 248 horsepower. It's plenty. Absolutely plenty. Any more than that, you think oh, it's sort of getting out of its getting out of its comfort zone. Um, and interestingly, everybody here, both in Motorsport UK and just around the Bista Heritage site, <clears> and <throat> those you've been here for the scrambles or the collecting cars, it's a wonderful, wonderful oasis for people who like us who are addicted to cars. But the number of people came up today to say, that's a nice car. I bet that's nice to drive. It's simple, it's light, it's not too fast. A number of people have said, it's probably not too fast, is it? So I think raw speed is always going to feel good. But in the context of a modern performance car, lightness, how it feels, how it steers, the fact that it stops, those things are still enjoyable on the road. It's got to be. Otherwise, the idea of a performance car will just become a historic legacy and curiosity. So we're always going to be amazed by have you seen how fast this new whatever it else is but the enduring emotion will come from the other things that we love performance cars to do so my my essay would conclude <laughs> with actually it's not that important to the modern performance car although secretly we all still love it and if we didn't have that opportunity like the Taycan is just an amazing thing it's just well oh, how, how that feels it's just you've been launched on a rocket but it's okay. not the same thing as a and now. And now, if you'd like to stand, we'll sing hymn number 243. <laughs> we plough the fields and scatter. <laughs> I've, I, can, I know that one. It's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll... Um, do you know what? Neil Clifford, can you take that argument and explode it, please? Be well, devil's advocate. Give me the counter argument. Come on. Aren't we just being old farts? <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. This podcast does tra attract quite a number of old farts to listen to old farts, but I think it's as much about the data. When you, when it's not about the reality of going two hundred and one miles an top hour, top trumps. 40. It's about the top trumps element. It's about my car goes faster than yours. Yeah, I'm not. So, yeah, I, I, I admit to that. I like that as well. Let <clears> him <throat> speak. Let him speak, Chris. He let you speak. No, I, I think I think no. I was I was just at this London concourse thing, and I, I hang out with all the sort of cool, much cooler dudes than me, the young, the young photographers, the young Instagram guys that are now, you know, they were seventeen without a job five years ago, and they're not they're all on hundred grand a year now, driving around in DBS Aston Martins like our good friend Freddie, who's a genius <laughs> photographer, and hanging out with all that lot a keeps me young, but also you listen to how they talk, and they talk about the stats like we used to with top trumps and they're like oh my god well that you know that new the, the piece there is much faster than the 458 yeah. and the 458 is not very fast because none of them can bloody drive them though no but they, they, they no you're sounding like an old fart as well i am a, no I'm, I'm being deliberately opposite I'm, I, I can be all part all parties in this argument i see it all you yeah. know I, I i don't really I've, I've only ever maxed speed one of my cars ever which was a 993 X51 X, uh, turbo on the way down to Le Mans. Obviously, there was a short piece of motorway that was, was, was unrestricted. In Germany. Yeah. yeah, Germany. I went via Germany. It and just 100, uh, it's like almost 180 on the speedo, but it was probably 175. Being chased by some lunatic in a TBR and a GT3 Mark I, R, um, yeah, GT3 996 Gen 2 Red. And I, it was hideous i thought i'm you know i'm gonna try and really max out this car and be very macho it was really not very good fun at all it was horrible it just goes too fucking fast doesn't it but i do <laughs> love i do love the fact that it's a turbo and it does go faster than the normal 993 so i think for most blokes who love facts information data stats yeah. we you know we're all that's we're, all of us you know, we're all that yeah. aren't we it matters, you know, if that new DB12, is it? I can't yeah. Remember. yeah. If that did 221 miles per hour, and by the way, well done to our friends at 
um, uh, the, what's his name, Gortler on, on Instagram, that's just done 205 miles per hour today in the Bulldog. In the Bulldog, they did that, yeah. yeah. Oh, Actually, you know, Manx Meyer and Gauntlet and the, the guys there, amazing. You know, this car four years ago should have done 200, 200 miles an hour and they've just done it today in Scotland. I think it matters if the DB12 did 221 miles per hour, they'd sell more of them. It's, so I think um, it does matter, even though I don't like doing it myself. I think, I think the question that Chris posed, the reason why I probably didn't want to bring it into the agenda was it sits at the very heart of my... Uh, professional insecurities because I vacillate hugely on this subject and I haven't I've never resolved it and I'll give you the scenario I come off a mountain road in Wales I'm in an Elise 1.8 Gen 1 I've got the aluminium brakes on the front and I've got I've just had the most lovely experience I've used that supple ride taking the bumps I've got steering feel I don't even need the fucking radio I can't reach it it's over there but I don't care because I don't need it. I, I basically feel like I'm in Colin Chapman's bladder. I'm like, I'm basically a part of his body. <laughs> you know, this is me. And, I, and I've read this. I've read everything from set right to Cropley to Gavin Green to <laughs> Russell Bulgin. Uh, this, is the, this is the apex of my life. And I get to the bottom of the mountain. I get down to the bottom of Neath, head to the Valley Road, and I put my foot down. And I get fucking smoked by a 320D. <laughs> and, then I'm, and then I'm really angry. So... <laughs> Uh, this is the two, these are the two bits. This is the dichotomy of my car enthusiasm. Yep. I want to be the former, and, and but I want to be immune to the feelings of of just being just emasculated by the latter experience. Because I think p the part of the inner car nerd, car addict, that we all want to deny is that at the traffic lights, we want to have the weapon of choice. Yep. You want to know you can smoke the bugger next to you. I even at my most relaxed. I could be there, but I'm still thinking. Oh, yeah, definitely. I want. I want to. I wish I was in my 911 Turbo now because I want to take care of that CSL. <laughs> and that that is that's real life top trumps. And I think yeah. that's the bit I can't deny because I, I like Chris. I buy into the purity. I buy into the interaction. I'm much more interested in how a car makes me feel than what it can actually do empirically. But I can't deny that last bit. That's, yeah, that's I know. Me too. That's the boy racer, as the phrase will never go out of We're date. That's the boy racer. We are all and still 12. I know. And that's the, that's the bit that I, I really find difficult. So I've, I can't resolve it. And again, for me, the answer is the hybrid solution. You've got to have both in your shed. You need a Caterham 7, but you also need some. You need a R35 Skyline that's been to Litcho and has got 34,000 horsepower. <laughs> and if you put your foot down, time fucking goes backwards in Tewkesbury. You know, you need you need one of those. So so it, for me, it's it's a difficult one to resolve. I don't know, Edward. Tell us what you think. You've driven some bloody fast stuff. Well, no, I, I think you've all you've all summarised it very well. And, and Neil, you you I, there is. I don't think any one of any of the car manufacturers are brave enough to go backwards no. to, for Ferrari to say, no, we're just going to do 500 brake horsepower now, and you know we 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 don't we don't need these top speeds. I think they they are they do chase these numbers probably because they're paying in you know marketing top trumps. They they need to do it, but yeah. I, the, the the one thing I don't like about some of the brand new very fast cars is that you have to go very fast in them to get the thrill out of using those cars and mclaren are the worst of those you know if you want to if you want to be thrilled by a senna you know you are going to be breaking the law in an instant and 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 that that is something i don't particularly enjoy i, I like to work to get the best performance out of a car um but yeah frankly the thrill of going fast is a thrill indeed yeah, and, you know, we talked. We talked about it on the TT. It wouldn't look as fun if their average lap was thirty-five miles an hour, yeah. would it? <laughs> the only negative for me to sound like an old fart is that cars don't sound as good as they used to. I don't yeah. really mind if they're not as fast or they're faster. Who cares? Four eight eight versus well, frankly, three sixty or three five five. It is a shame that cars don't sound as good. That, that's so right. Actually, I was good. thinking when you were t talking earlier on about uh, Neil when you took over that a four five eight 
you know, that really was a brilliant Ferrari. You know, it was dynamic. It was fast. That gearbox was incredible. But you didn't, it sounded brilliant. You didn't have to drive it fast. When yeah. I, the first time yeah. I drove a 488, for, for me, and I, I think I was in the Cotswolds somewhere, it was, everything about it was too quick. Um, the steering was too quick. All, all the inputs, I, 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 it felt like I was drunk and I didn't know what I was doing, but it just, it just was too fast. What's your reference on that, Chris? Because you're famous as a Ferrari journalist. I think, uh, I, I don't think the 458 sounds great. I think it sounds a bit manufactured to me. I'm, 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 when you, your comment there about sound, sound is totally separate to volume. And I think car makers for years mistook the two. Yeah. They just thought if it made them louder, that we'd think they sound great. You know, you get in a DB5, it's not a loud car, but it sounds magnificent hmm. um, when you get going. And so the quality of noise is something quite separate to the volume of noise. Um, but when it comes to cars like 458, 488, I'm a bit, I'm a bit cynical because of my day job. I think, I think sports cars stopped being able to deliver an awful lot at very low speed a long, long time before that. I think, I think if you get in a 355, it's not really doing an awful lot until you get going. Then you've got to go back further. I think for me, the last generation of cars that really made me feel that they were that they were communicating with me at low speed was was probably pre power steering so i'd say the last the last cars would be something like g series 911s late 80s i think into yeah. the 90s stuff was already becoming quite numb if i'm honest with you and and i and i've got used to that numbness so i'm not i'm not too worried about that to avoid the numbness you've actually got to deliberately make a very brave choice to go for a car like a caterham or a lotus that i think the one car that i wish i'd kept and i still had in my shed is a very basic lotus elise i really do regret not having one just as just as a sort of a base a base point of what it should be like yeah yeah i really do regret not having one in fact after this we should all go and look on, on yeah isn't, there, isn't, there, isn't this sort of you know you, it is a little bit of a cry to freedom though isn't it this conversation in the sense that we're living in quite a surveillance society certainly on the roads with cameras average speed um devices you go to europe it's much the same thing and so I mean, I'm in central London. It's 20 miles an hour everywhere. In a few places, it's 30 miles an hour, which switches to 20. You can find yourself on a motorway, which is very often restricted to 50 or 60 in a variable way. Certainly 70 is up a limit of normal. And I do wonder whether what you're buying, if you buy a car with a label that says it goes very, very, very quickly, is this promise of freedom, but a promise of freedom and speed that actually you're very, very, very unlikely <clears throat> To attain or ever use and you know it is and um, maybe that was why track days started to become more and more common you know 30 yeah. years ago cameras start to appear can't go quickly on the road you buy this canon and unless you're trying to do that kind of luca montezemolo versus volkswagen golf gti for 300 yards at a traffic light you know where where do you use any of this i i have actually driven um one of the early 458s with paddle shift. And um, and I got driven in one too. And um, I, mean, I drove it, I drove it just outside London on uh, quite a straight bit of motorway and uh, a little bit of a country road that came off it. But I actually got driven around Yas Marina by um, Felipe Massa in, in a 458. And the two experiences, I mean, I'm obviously not Massa, but the two experiences were completely different. Yeah. <laughs> At 70 miles an hour in kind of third gear and flipping up to fourth on a bit of M1, it was one experience. But doing 165, I think he, he got it to 170 before the, the breaking point at the end of the main straight. It was just, it was a completely different experience. When, you know, when he blip, you know, it felt like I was being kicked in the back. And for him, of course, this was all slow motion because this is what? 25 seconds slower than he does it in a Formula One car, whatever it was. But it, it was an amazing back-to-back. -back. I mean, there weren't, you know, the experience wasn't exactly back-to-back. -back. There were several months apart. But the experience in the same car, one driven by me on a road, two, same car, driven by Felipe Massa on a track. It's a completely different experience. I mean, he, he, amazing guy, amazing driver, but really genuinely amazing experience. I think I'm going to conclude that one by saying we all agree 
broadly on that. Um, and I'm, I will drop in one last note. There's a very obvious solution to this conundrum. It's called the motorcycle. It yeah. makes you feel completely alive and it's very, very, it's very, very basic and it's all about feel. And when you get to the traffic lights, you can still smoke anything. Mm -hmm. So maybe the motorcycle is the answer to that one. Moving on. <laughs> a little bit of F1 chat, better race at the weekend, which yep. I thought was if I was issuing an out of 10 mark and it was a weekly test for English pre-GCSE, I'd give that six and a half out of ten. No more than that for me. I think a lot of people have been more generous about it. I thought some of the overtaking was a little bit drs -y. I thought the bloke at the front ran away with it. The midfield, the overtaking sort of petered out. And I got the sense that it, people sort of lost interest in the race after a fashion. Is that a fair summary, Chris Cooper? Um, mostly, yeah. Um, I mean, on the end of the week, Mercedes looked a bit slow and looked a lot better Sunday. I was speaking to people in the paddock today and they said, yeah, that's because everybody else dropped the ball. Aston was slow. Ferrari did just manage. You'll have views on Ferrari, I'm sure. So there was one takeaway I had from it, which I just thought sort of summed up for one team and one in particular one driver. Sort of how did I end up here? So there's a quote I read. I'm just going to read it out. And this driver was interviewed after the race and said, the pace was as expected today, which was bad. I don't think I was expecting anything else from our performance, really. And when this driver was asked about the possibility of whether they might have had points, the driver said, probably not, no, because we're slow. We have been all year. There's nothing else to say. Lando. Lando Norris, exactly. Ooh. And I was- Who qualified again, third. And I was talking to somebody today at a dinner last night and said, how is, how is that gonna survive? So some of you noticed it's in, been in the press. Uh, I think quite extraordinarily, McLaren have hired Rob Marshall from Red Bull. He was sort of, he and Dan Fallows with Adrian, sort of the, there's a couple of other guys, very, very impressive guys. But Rob's been there 17 years, head of engineering car design. Uh, my mate, John, I've talked about, worked for, for Rob for a long, long time and had nothing but absolute sort of awe and praise for him. So maybe, okay. maybe eventually... Rob Marshall and the other getting, and you know, there's hardly anybody left to pinch from Red Bull now. Adrian Newey's side, but that for me summed up well. Where is McLaren at, and what does Lando think? Yeah, not great, not great. Uh, Neil, did you watch it or not? I did watch it. I did. Well, I have to watch it now, otherwise, I, you know, I've got to try and attempt to be slightly intelligent on this bloody podcast, haven't I? So I've got to. I've got to watch it. I do watch it because my my son is is uh, is massively into it. I suppose what do I, Mercedes better than we thought? You know, maybe if you're Lewis now, you're like, oh, maybe I don't go to Ferrari. This could be a bit of a yeah. this could be a bit of a cock up for me now, which is a sort of shame slightly because I like the intrigue of him suddenly going to Ferrari next year. But I suppose good for Mercedes. Ferrari, I'm just depressed about. Manage. We'll leave that one to you, I think. But it's such a shame. But we, we we're going to do our two car garage for Ferrari F1 at some point, aren't we? How <laughs> to control, alt, delete the whole bloody thing. Um, and I suppose you garage, have to just yeah. say Max is fantastic. You know, I know. We, well, I say he's hard to like, but frankly, you can't not admire the fact that he is outstandingly good. Yeah. You know, it's probably like what it, people felt like about Lewis. And we just got the other end of the stick, and he's really bloody good. Yeah, yeah. What, I agree. what can you say to that? Manish, give us, um, give us. First of all, get your Kleenex ready. Finish whatever you were sculling there. Look like he's drinking a nice single malt. Uh, and tell us how you <laughs> feel about. Tell us how you feel about the Scuderia, because in some respects, this was even more depressing than the last couple of races. Oh, it's just it all feels so baked in. And I think that's why I feel so depressed. It There's something about the kind of cut and thrust of Formula One, the ruthlessness of it, the I'll pinch you and I've got your driver and we're going to try this. And what you were talking about last week, you know, Colin Chapman pretending it's a diff and not ground effect and Ferrari believing it for weeks and then finally working out. There's just something that feels very baked in about this formula. It's hard to see how things are going to shift massively until 2026 and we have these great big 
rule changes. And I think that's why we were all dreaming maybe Lewis will go to mm -hmm. Ferrari, because that's just suddenly not baked in anymore. There's suddenly something new happening and wonderful, and it, maybe it will change everything. And in fact, frankly, if Lewis was coming eighth in a Ferrari every week, I think we'd all be really happy. You know? <laughs> it would just be, you know, that's as fast as that Ferrari could possibly go. You know, anybody else's hands, other other maybe than than Max's. Now, I think just seeing Leclerc be kind of booted out in Q1, hearing the commentary saying, why aren't Ferrari going out now? Why aren't they going out now? Why aren't they getting a back? Why are they doing something completely different? It was just all very, very hard. And I mean, the only teeny point of controversy in the race, you know, did George Russell make up 37 places by missing that corner at the beginning? Oh. And did that, you know, did that is it, that's what we're talking about, you know? And Max getting three track limits warnings, mm. you know, really exciting stuff. This it, yeah. I mean it's getting harder and harder, isn't it? As the weeks go on. As we we have a we have, I will drop a name. We have a, a very sort of important McLaren engineer's son he works with us you know he's um he's working with us on a couple of formula one projects that we're hoping to make and um he came in on uh, monday morning i said do you watch a race said, of course i watch a race and i said what did you think of it you know i heard there were a hundred overtaking maneuvers and he said but there were no fights yeah and i think that was it actually do you know what there were a couple but the race uh, the tv director missed them sonoda and zhu were going yes. over songs that was pretty good yeah. But you're right. They were DRS. Yeah. They were DRS overtakes. They weren't fights. Good phrase that. But if you had, if you just could change. you imagine a basking, sorry, I was just gonna say, could you imagine a basketball match where um it's only two players? So you've got your hoop at either end, you've got two players, and what you're allowed to do is as I come to go and pass Mr. Clifford, I'm five eight, Neil six four. As I come to pass Neil Clifford, what I do is I've got a zap gun and I press the zap gun and Neil freezes in his position. And then what I do is I just go round him and the skill is now, all I can do is just drop the ball in the hoop. Then Neil gets the ball and he comes at me and he presses his zap gun and I freeze. And he just throws the ball in the hoop. And then when we get to the end of it, they say, but they each scored a hundred times. <laughs> and everyone just goes, I didn't see him get past little manish and I didn't see get little manish get past big me. I just didn't see it. it. Kind of feels like that a little bit. I was reading an article in Motorsport because obviously now we all have to try to be more intelligent about our knowledge. And it was basically saying it's all about the tires and who can handle those tires, particularly on I'm really out of my comfort zone now, but the, the Spanish circuit is a very fast circuit, very hard on tyres. Therefore, Max just demonstrated his ability to really handle the tyres so much better than everyone else. I'm not sure whether that's true, but certainly if you're Checo, you're like, oh, fuck, I look a bit of an idiot here. Yeah. It's a Max. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan of Barcelona as a circuit to race on. I thought they did. A, I thought taking the chicane away was going to be worse than it was. Um, but I didn't really, you know, the last two corners, they were driving through at massive speed, but I didn't really get the sense of seeing the speed on the TV. No, no. They're probably the fastest three corners in Europe now. I wasn't really getting the sense of it. Ferrari are just all over the place. And bless him, I think Carlos Sainz, he comes across as a really lovely man. But he, but he uttered one of a phrase that will come back to haunt him forever when he says over the radio, I have pace to spare. And two laps later, Lewis just drives straight past him. Yeah, that wasn't his greatest just moment. thinking, here we go. I, yeah, I, I fear for the rest of the season. I'm really glad that Mercedes have found some pace. Mm, yeah, that's good, team. isn't it? I, I suspect that Red Bull are sandbagging in terms of upgrades. Red Bull have probably thought we should have bought upgrades two races ago, but we didn't need to. So we'll just bring, we'll just wait right. and wait and wait until they get close to us. Then they'll just move away again. That's all they'll do. It's all, it's all being a bit stage managed. And, and Neil makes a wonderful point, I think, about tyres. I mean, it's what everyone talks about from beginning to end, all they talk about. But, but you know what? That twas, twas ever thus. It is a tyre formula. Don't get me wrong. Bridgestone versus Michelin, just because yeah. they didn't talk about them so much. It's interesting. When there's a tyre war going on, you're not as incentivised to talk about your tyres because you mm. might upset your tyre supplier. Secret. 
Yeah. Um, but it's always been a tyre form. Motorsport's always been about tyres, you know, but they just, they're a bit more open whinging about it now. And let's face Sorry, it. But the point I was making was more the kind of that, that big Monica point that they're, um, the difference between their ultimate times and the times that they actually do in races, that that's such a big delta now. Yes, that's, and Monaco is the worst of it. Seven seconds slower. It, 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 you're right, it's about tyres, but it's about, you know, I, in the end, why did the Mercedes suddenly switch on? Bradley Lord, I think, dropped a little key, said, well, it's very hot today. Yeah. And that didn't make me think it was an aero issue. Suddenly, I think the Mercedes tyres switched on. Bang. And it was gone. Yeah. What's the next race? Don't Canada. Know. Canada. 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 Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. Who won his first race? In fact, his only race in Canada. John Alessi. Alessi, 1995. Good knowledge, team. Good knowledge. 1995. Now, um, here we go. We're going to move to our two-car garage. You're going to have to play <laughs> with me here because this has been set by Manish. And if people think... It I'm, wasn't set by me. It wasn't set by Manish. No, How it was, it was clever Jason. <laughs> oh, was it Jason, your friend Jason? Clever, yeah, Ed's friend too. Clever... Clever Jason is his name in my phone. Is it, Jason. What, uh, it just what, what was going? Was he drunk when he sent that? <laughs> no, no, no. I just think he's more intelligent than all of us, and therefore has got two brains. Have but... I met Jason? Um, probably. No, no. You would have. We, I think he came to our dinner, um, one of our dinners in Soho. Okay, mega. Right here we go. Sorry about that, clever, Jason. I didn't mean to Jason. take your. Didn't mean to take your, your glory away from you, Jason. Right. Uh, do you? By, by the way, Neil, do you know what his two cars are for this? Yes. Fine. Well, you'll have to tell us those at the end. Okay. This is. I'm sure this is going to cause some consternation because none of us are ever quite sure in which decade we're supposed to be spending the money, whether it's adjusted <laughs> for inflation or whether Chris Cooper is going to obey any of the fucking rules at all. <laughs> no, no. You. You. So, so let's space. just let's just see where this goes. All right. Deep breath. You are Marty McFly. <laughs> and you've just arrived in 2015 from 1985 in your time-travelling DeLorean with girlfriend Jessica Parker. You're surprised to find that only has Jessica totally changed appearance in transit, actress Claudia Wells being replaced by Elizabeth Shue, but there are no flying cars. You need to save your family, uh, requiring a, fitting, a fittingly cool four-seater, but have a bit of leisure time on the side to cruise around California with Jessica and also fancy a two-seater convertible. Yeah, this isn't embellished at all, is it? Okay, being a time traveller, you invested in some stocks on your trip back to 1955 that have paid off handsomely, making you a multi-millionaire in 1985. Unfortunately, since then, with the tech boom, they've gone to shit, but you still have $150,000 to spend. You can buy new or used, but critically, having learned your lesson from Back to the Future Part 1, you can't risk any chance of a breakdown. Um, I, think, I think this podcast has properly jumped the shark. Uh, <laughs> Manish, get on with it. Oh, God. Um, <clears throat> so I thought... Doc had turned a DeLorean into a time machine by using electricity. Masses. Remember, he said, it's like 70 gigawatts, Marty, and you've got to do whatever, 69 miles an hour past the clocks. So I thought in 2015, Marty would buy an electric car. Ooh. I thought he would just have to do it. Mm. Something that's a little bit reliable, a little bit Californian. So I decided he would spend the vast majority of his money on a Tesla Model S, but the P85D. Now, I found out that these things, at the time, they cost $105,000. Wow. Jesus in, Christ. And, but, but you got a, two subsidies, one for $6,000 and one for $4,000. I can't remember what these rebates were. So basically, it, um, the, the price comes tumbling down to $95,000 for your plastic Tesla. Now, I could see Marty McFly in this car. Um, what I didn't know about this car was I knew there was a trunk at the front because obviously there's no engine. But did you know they call them frunks? Yeah, yes. front's trunk. I had no idea. Front, I had no idea. Yep. I had seen the back trunk, which has got the kind of trap door that you can put your mother-in-law in. And it's a phrase, a phrase coined by the Germans because which car from Stuttgart's always had a frunk? Oh, you're kidding. That yes, is they stole phenomenal. it from Porsche. Honk. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I think it's great. It's It's got that 17-inch 
iPad so he can actually just watch Back to the Future <laughs> on that while he's cruising up and down his kind of Californian highways. But it, it was the it was the it was the performance figures that actually just made my jaw drop. 691 brake horsepower, naught to 60 in 3.1 seconds, and a cap speed at 155 miles an hour. All-wheel drive, self-parking. I mean, it's got to be the car, hasn't it? I mean, you can yeah. see Marty in that, and Doc having a look at that and being just well, unbelievably well, wild. Right? Brown, and most importantly, Einstein would be very happy in there. So that was the first one. Now, the second one, I does anyone remember the film American Gigolo? Yes. Yeah. Do you remember how that started? It just started with sort of like pawn shot after pawn shot of that black Mercedes 450 SL with um what was Julian's surname? I can never remember what his surname was, the Richard Gere character. It's a one of Kane. It's a Bobby Kane. 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 He said Je m'appelle Julian Kane. So we've got our American Gigolo. I would buy a 420 SL though, the R107. I think it's just an incredible car, beautiful engine. I think you could pick one up for about $55,000 back then. Um, not that powerful, V8, 220 horses. Um, I probably would, if I was driving in California, get the automatic. I know you'll hate me for that, but they're it's only just, automatic. I, really. think automatic. Automatic. I thought you could get a five. Can't you get a five speed for that? There, there, five, there, speed, there are yeah, some, five speed, 300, six cylinder. There yeah. are some oh. 107s manual, very rare. Yeah, okay, yeah. so that, it, it would be that, but I would get black with black leather. I'd get them to rip the back seat out. It would have it would have uh, a black roof, and, um, and that would be it. I'd be going around saying, Je m'appelle Julian Kane. And remember who did the music? Giorgio Moroder. That's he wrote right. the opening. Ah, yeah. oh, it's such a good opening. And in fact, okay. the opening montage, if you watch, he pulls up outside a very expensive clothing store he goes in and he's with a suspiciously older woman and you're wondering what is a guy like that and he's checking himself out in various clothes and then you see her writing the check lots and lots of little hints about what he does for a living in that maybe it's just emancipation you just don't know manage you're so judgmental yeah. 1980 um, right, right. <laughs> uh neil clifford who probably has spent upwards of 19 hours no i haven't actually i, I actually my my sports car genuinely is the same as what jason suggested I mean, I'm spending all my money on the sports car, bollocks to the family car. LA is all about all fur coat and no knickers. It doesn't matter what your real life is like. It's what you portray yourself in Los Angeles that matters. So I'm buying the most leggiest BMW Z8 yeah. that I can find in Los Angeles. It's got 100,000 miles on the clock. It's that it's that lovely um what was it? It was it was I can't remember the name of the blue actually. Topaz blue. Topaz, you're bloody right. Topaz with cream. Um probably hundred and thirty thousand dollars. You could pick one up in 2015 before they went mad. Loads of miles on the clock, but it won't break down. Super pretty. I just saw a, a lovely 507 at the old concourse here in London. What a gorgeous looking car, big V8, M5 engine manual fantastic dash you can x, really... x hugh grant few stains on the seats yeah that? exactly yeah. you know start off at the hollywood bowl when the sun's when you're dark drive the whole of the uh, mulholland drive end up for coffee mornings in bloody malibu fantastic and then i'll have like 10 grand left and i'm going to go and buy frankly something japanese depressingly because that's the only thing that won't break down on the odyssey mpv they're brilliant <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting an old Land Cruiser. Okay. Old Land Cruiser, ten thousand dollars. They have loads of miles on the clock. It'll never break down. I'll get the same money for it, but I've got the Z8 and I can look cool. I love a Z8. I, I missed the boat there. Do you know what the Autocar couldn't get a Z8 from BMW to do the road test for Autocar magazine, so we borrowed one from the Lovett family. Remember that? That was the, that. That is the road test car. We borrowed it from the Lovett family. Um, on that note, Edward, what are your two cars? Well, it says in the description. Here, <laughs> you need to save your family. What? What's that bit about? Oh, because that's part of the. But they're on the run. That's the narrative of the films, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, Biff no, is just, after them. Biff. So you is don't. After so you them. don't need to buy an ambulance or become a doctor, Edward. Don't no, worry. No, I'm fine. And I, I, whilst um. 
Manish said his then. I slightly got my years. I've got my car sorted out, but I all, all of a sudden went thought, actually, electric isn't a, a bad idea. And if we were doing it today, I think I'd have to be waiting to take delivery of a Cybertruck, the you Tesla would. Cybertruck. But it clearly says 2015. So yes, yeah, I know. I, which I've got, I did read it and I've got it written down. And because it said save your family, I needed something slightly utilitarian and obviously American. So I bought a F- Ford Raptor. Yeah, um, I, I did good. find some of some of my investments in the tech went to shit, but luckily I bought five hundred dollars worth of Berkshire Hathaway stock for sixteen dollars a share in nineteen fifty five, and I've just fa- I've just found out I still have them, so uh, I've sold those, and that's given me three point two million dollars in return. That's <laughs> that's quite a good return. Um, so I bought a Ford Raptor. And I've sent it to John Hennessy to turn it into a Velociraptor. Yeah. <laughs> six by six. Because <laughs> I think I can save my family with that. <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah. What about your sports car? And, and obviously, you know, M- Marty McFly, I, I don't think they wouldn't buy, you know, a European car. You know, this, you know, this is, he, he's an American icon. And because he went back to 1950s or 1955, he caught a glimpse when he went into the stockbroker to buy his shares of a Corvette C1. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the car he needs to drive. It's going to be blue. It's going to have white wall tires on it. And it's going to have the little white side strikes on both uh, both sides. And that's going to be his cruiser. For a the Velociraptor and Canyons. a C1 Corvette. I think it's the most schizophrenic car toys we've had. I think they're good. It's quite a schizophrenic question, though, Neil. It is. You're, you're it is. Saving your family question. and cruising around California. It is, it is. But there we go. Um, now, let's go for um, Chris Cooper's, please. Interesting film, Back to the Future, made by uh, Robert Zemeckis, who also did um, Forrest Gump. Uh, and... There are parables and threads in both of those films which create symmetry for what we talked about today, actually right at the start of this, in terms of a TT, which is about grabbing the opportunity and ambition and seizing the moment. So, and Zemeckis was quite big on that. And there's kind of the threads of the first film, which was sort of America at an interesting point of inflection in the mid 80s and how Reagan was going to take the country forward. And you can draw that thread all the way back to FDR and his New Deal post immediately pre-war. And that um, extraordinary uh, statement that in the late uh, early 30s elections, Republicans had, which was a chicken in every oven, a car in every backyard. And you can draw that thread all the way through to Back to the Future. But the the symmetry here is that aspiration and that ambition to want to do better. And that's what the Back to the Future film is all about. That's why I think it's so interesting. So I think if they arrived in 2015, they would want to continue that line and be aspirational and think about reliability. And probably having come from 1985 um, US, when US cars ter- weren't terribly reliable or wonderful, I think they go for two German cars. And my inspiration came from them. Actually, again, my boys said, because they're always sending me links to what's on collecting cars about to sell <laughs> or hasn't been or has been sold. I said to them, you're talking to the worst person who never can buy anything because I always get outbid on collecting cars. But there were two cars. I think you have a 2015, fresh from the shop, CLS 63 wagon. That's mm. a really nice, cool car that would protect your family from any villain or biff or otherwise. But then I Some, think he would go... It looks cool again, that. It does look cool. And it one always looks cool. And one of them, actually a 2017 model, sold on collecting cars on Sunday evening. And I thought I nearly got, had to give it a tickle, but I kind of was driving back from Zandvoort, so I kind of missed the opportunity. That is the most seamless, lovely plug I've ever heard, Chris Cooper. You are a <laughs> professional man. Lovely I've given this touch. some thought. I give lovely thought. touch. And the second car, the sports car, I would go back to the future. I would go back and bring it to the future. I would have a 1985, I think you can have a 1985, 3.2 Carrera Sport Cabrio. And one of those sold on collecting cars on Sunday evening, about 40 grand. But I think, again, I missed it. It looked like a lovely thing. And I think you'd have enough money. So I think sort of Richard Tuttle's 
business in 2015 would have been a suitable location to send his 3-2 Sport Carrera to have some lovely tactile bits put on it for the total of $150,000. So I think the parable of grasping the moment, thinking about aspiration, I think if you arrived with Marty and family in 2015, I think those are the two cars you'd have. That's a very good answer. I'll argue with that. I think you've all, you've delivered us some great cars here, but I'm, I'm going to take this a bit more literally because I, I pretty much guarantee I've watched the Back to Future films a lot more times than you have. Um, I, I'm an obsessive, particularly with the motor vehicles on the films. Um, and I can't, I can't arrive in 2015 within the world of Back to the Future and, and not acknowledge the cars that were on the film in 2015. So it's quite obvious that my family guy has to be a Citroen DS because they chose the DS to be the futuristic taxi of the 2015, which was a car made and designed in the 50s in France. I still think it's one of the most bizarre things ever happened in a film franchise. I want to acknowledge that. It's got to be reliable. So this DS has gone off and had everything done to it. It's a minter. It's so good. It's a later Palace 70s car it's stunning it's got the it's got the really boring dashboard the slightly ugly bumpers but it's got those plush seats the thicker seats that you just sink into and they give you a big hug now i could have gone for a 1946 ford coupe because i wanted to remind myself of defeating biff tannen back in 1955 but i but it just struck me that that wouldn't be the easiest way to travel around so i'm going to go a little bit obtuse there is a convertible in 2015 in Back to the Future 2. Um, it's a BMW 635 CSI that's red that the young Biff drives. It's had its roof cut off. It is a 635 underneath if you look at it up close. So for me, it's a one-off 635 nice. CSI Ooh. convertible from the set of Back to the Future 2. They're the greatest films. They really are. So glad we got asked that. Thank you so very wait, much. So Marty is going to drive Biff's car in yes. 2015 he is because he arrives there it's a new reality <laughs> the great thing about back to the future is there are two realities in this reality he's defeated him and the young biff isn't there anymore neil what was uh lovely jason's choice he he was z8 yeah was he? And he was in the new jeep wrangler well in 2015 so he went yeah. jeep wrangler but then he went leggy leggy z8 okay right we're now going to move on to um, some music. Let me just let someone in quickly. Please come in. Please come in. We've got another <laughs> two minutes to go. Right. Um, now's our music selection. Uh, I'm going to start this week, uh, and I'm going to let you know that one of there's very few downsides to spending a week in the sunshine on a motorcycle. One is that you miss listening to music in your tra on your travels. I don't listen to. I don't have earbuds in when I ride a bike because I feel quite disconnected from the machine. I've tried it in the past, but it doesn't quite work. Also, when you put a crash helmet on. If one of them moves a bit and you get a pressure really point, uncomfortable. it's really bad for the next <laughs> couple of hours. So I've really missed music. And I got back in the car yesterday to wobble up to uh, to Austria to collect a new M2. And that's another thing we'll talk about next week. Um, and, and I just was so thrilled to be able to get back into some music. So I wanted to go a little bit um, topical. And I noticed that Astrid Gilberto, the woman that sang the vocal for the girl for Ipanema, she died today. So I wanted to think about oh, that. We should acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, uh, but I then I got in some big albums, some big thought-provoking albums. And I've, everything I've listed here has been lightweight. So I went through loads of bits and bobs. And I have to say, for me, Flaming Lips, uh, Yoshimi Battles, The Big Pink Robots, part one of the song. I think that might be the greatest album ever written. I, I think it's complicated. I think it's bizarre. I think when you understand the meaning of what the Pink Robots are, it's just an astonishing piece of work. So yeah, Yoshimi, go and listen to it. And I, it's just so uplifting for me. It's a gorgeous piece of music. Wonderful. Who's going next? So I couldn't <laughs> walk past Back to the Future. <laughs> no, that's true. And uh, it's really tempting to say Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry because I just, you know, the when Marty starts playing it and just goes completely wild in the first film, that's just amazing. But and maybe because it's a rite of passage because, you know, we were all young, very young when the first film came out. But Huey Lewis, The Power of Love, is such a booming, busting anthem. So, yeah, I'd like to see on the playlist 
Huey Lewis, The Power of Love. Mm. Mm. Uh, no Clifford. I'm going Blur. I thought I'd round up my sort of 90s Brit pop. I think um, I think even though Modern Life is rubbish, their first album was amazing. I think what a, a brilliant second album in Park Life. It was probably the best album cover. The Two Greyhounds. Um, and for me, the best song on the album and the best song of Blur is Tracy Jacks because it it talks about the pressures of everyday life actually and the, the 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 it's a bit of Reginald Perrin actually of of a guy just sort of like losing it completely trying to hold it all together doesn't hold it all together um and the the lyrics I'd love to stay here and be normal but it was always so overrated <laughs> you know it's deep it's fantastic he's you know Damon Alban is a bit sort of bit of a 90s Paul Weller, really. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant lyrics. So British. You couldn't get more British than than Blur in, in, in those lyrics. So really good. That's the, that's my choice. Anish. You're Joe Moroda. Brought him up once already. And I was <laughs> thinking about it, ended up going down my Giorgio Moroda wormhole. And um, it's the opening titles to Midnight Express. It's called yeah. Chase. Yeah. Ooh, and you listen film. to that in a car it'll blow your head off and there's an extended version and what i didn't know but perhaps should have known was that it won the oscar for best best, best soundtrack yeah. in and you know who played one of the synthesizers on it harold faltermeyer oh, 1978 wow young harold faltermeyer just unbelievable. So yeah. yeah, Midnight Express, Chase, scary movie as well. Very scary, scary movie. Yeah. Very scary movie. Um, Edward, are you going to give some music this week, or have you decided you don't like music this week? Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I haven't had any chance to listen to it. I've been on holiday with my children and uh, been looking after them. But I'm super tramp is what I'm going with this Ooh. week, and the logical song. Oh, it's a yeah. great song. Yeah. Brilliant. It's a great song. Brilliant. The seventies was so underrated, really, in music terms, yeah. weren't they? Really, and what a great album cover that is! Yeah, yeah. that's cover. Yeah. Um, right, that brings this to a close. That's quite a long one. Sorry about that. That's a bit of an ordeal for all of you. Go and get some fresh air. Uh, and I apologise <laughs> on behalf of Manish, Chris, Neil, Edward, and myself for wasting yet another hour and forty minutes of your time. Uh, join us again next week when we might discuss the BMW M2. We might talk about fifth wheel caravans. We might talk about a car that Neil's tried to start that has failed to start. Um, until next week, have a lovely weekend. See you later. Bye-bye.